I'm Dr Miranda Fricker and I teach in the philosophy department at Birkbeck. One of the things I love about philosophy, which never ceases to amaze me, is the way it can cast a light on tensions, sometimes even contradictions, in our own pre-philosophical thinking. And one example of this that I'm very aware of is in moral philosophy, which I teach. And when students learn about moral philosophy, I think this amazes them too, that you get such amazingly contrasting moral theories of the same thing. After all, you're looking at the subject matter that is our everyday moral thinking and coming up with theories to try and help explain it and give a philosophical account of it. So the range of different philosophical accounts is kind of surprising. For instance, you have an everyday intuition, I think, that uh, moral judgments are action guiding. So what I mean by that is they influence action. So if I say to a child or to a friend, that's cruel. In saying that, I'm implying that he or she should stop what he's doing or at least pause for thought before carrying on. Or if I say, that's very kind how you're treating him, that's a way of encouraging further actions of a similar sort. So that's what we mean when we say that moral judgments and moral statements are action guiding. They either encourage or discourage the actions that they're about. Now that's led many people to think that there must be something of the emotional within moral judgments, some desire-like states which are a proper part of moral judgments. Because if you think about it, what motivates action isn't just belief alone. I might believe that there's a drink in the fridge, but it's not until I have a desire to drink that cold drink that I'm going to get out of my seat and go and fetch it from the fridge. So for the action to come, I need not only a belief, but also a relevant desire, or some sort of emotional desire-like state. A different sort of intuition that I think most of us have about our ordinary moral thinking is that much of the time, at least, it can be absolutely binding. It requires us, or as some would say, necessitates us to do a certain thing. That just seems to be built into the nature of many moral obligations. So, for instance, that suggests against the first intuition, that there's nothing of the emotional in moral judgments, because no matter what I think or feel, if I've made a solemn promise to a friend to attend a certain retirement party, I must go, even if I passionately don't want to go and much rather do something else instead. So that seems to suggest that there's nothing desire-like within moral judgments, and that the source of the authority of moral judgments comes from elsewhere, probably in pure reason. The two examples of these very different sorts of views as they become magnified in ethical theories can be found in the Scottish philosopher of the Enlightenment, David Hume, who's an 18th century philosopher, and Immanuel Kant, who came a little later historically, also an Enlightenment philosopher in Prussia. David Hume took the idea that moral judgments are action guiding with the associated view that that means they must primarily involve the emotions or desire-like states. And he came up with an entire subjectivist theory which showed that moral judgments were a matter of the expression of emotion, the giving of emotional responses to um, observed actions. In contrast, Kant picks up on the second idea, which is that moral judgments seem to have this ability to override all of our emotions, so that if I've made my solemn promise, even if I passionately don't want to go, I must keep my promise. And he took it that this revealed that the origin of the authority of our moral judgments was not in any desire-like state at all, not in any interest or emotion or inclination, as he put it, but rather in a kind of authority that none of us can shake off, namely our capacity for reason. So he took it that the overriding quality of moral judgments revealed that Moral judgments were not a matter of emotion, precisely not, for they're too contingent, but instead a matter of pure reason. What's remarkable about these two very contrasting views is that each one seems to have equal title to being rooted in our everyday moral thinking. In Hume's case, he takes the everyday idea that moral judgments are action guiding and that they therefore must contain some sort of emotion. In Kant's idea, he takes the everyday intuition that moral judgments can override our emotions. Reading these different authors enables a student to think about how far each theory is a good fit with our everyday moral thinking. And it also raises the question how far we expect philosophy to come up with a single coherent view of our everyday practice. It may be, after all, that our everyday moral thinking contains tensions and sometimes contradictions which can't actually be resolved. At any rate, a chance to look at the different sorts of views is what's offered by doing the external BA in the University of London.